And I'm presenting my paper on artist attitudes towards the changing character of recording studio. So this is uh, the second paper from my PhD that I, I presented the last one in Stockholm last year, which was on the producer attitudes towards the changing character of the recording studio. So this time we're going to see uh, how the artist felt in the differing recording spaces. So this research is an investigation into the creative agency of new music production spaces that have emerged in, emerged in the 25 years since the downturn in the number of large format recording studios. This downturn's primarily been triggered by uh, low cost di digital media production tools. A secondary trigger has been a subsequent decline in recording budgets. Combining these issues has meant that large format recording studio processes are giving way to lower cost DIY and bedroom uh, type recordings. In this research, I'm asking in what ways do DIY recording spaces change the experience for the recording artist? Can performers determine any difference in creative agency between uh, a DIY recording space or a large format recording space? <coughs> I address this uh, gap in understanding by evaluating the processes of recording in these scenarios. So I created recordings in a large format studio space at the university. And then uh, I created recordings in a DIY space found, uh, sourced by the artist, and set up uh, equipment that was um, had various restrictions uh, placed around it to keep it in line with a sort of more bedroom style recording. Uh, I I used participant interviews, participant observation. I was the producer on the on the project that didn't play any music on it, um, and I analysed the attitudes of the artists. Uh, towards creativity at the end of it. So let's talk a little bit about technology in space and uh, how it's changed uh, over, over time. So there has been this trajectory where technology, uh, as technology improves, so does production, etc. So if we look at a picture there from the acoustic era of recording, very uncomfortable, etc., down to a uh, control room, I picked this picture specifically that Sing Sing Studios in around 2005, where that studio, it hasn't closed, but they had to downsize significantly, and that's that they had to sell that uh, SSLK series console there. Um, but this is just showing the progression from the la late 19th century through to earlier this century. And music production and everyone has just assumed that everything is getting better. Uh, so, Digital music production has sort of disrupted this, this progress and I just want to see, are things getting better for the artist? Does the artist enjoy this change or, or not? Um, also, current home-based recording practices are claimed to be socially and musically detrimental. Uh, so we, within all this, I'm asking also, is the large format studio still relevant? Is this type of space still relevant in uh, today's uh, climate. So the associations between space and creativity are common. It's often assumed that the more comfortable an artist is, the better they'll perform. In the 1980s, it was not uncommon for a large, uh, uh, a large record company production for an artist to spend a whole day in the studio just assimilating with the abstract environment. Uh, that kind of, kind of practice these days is untenable. You just wouldn't think of burning a whole day of studio time just so that you feel comfortable moving carpets around and putting lamps up, etc. So the, the financial viability of the large format studio has been in question for some time. <coughs> Since home recording has merged with the introduction of MIDI, uh, it has only increased over, over time. Uh, and academics and... Uh, I've lost my mouse. It's no good, there we go. Academics and industry generally discuss the large format downturn negatively. However, there's evidence in a DIY context an experienced producer can facilitate an equivalent creative musical performance to those of the large format studio. DIY scenarios remove architectural and potential creative barriers built into large format studio recording. People instantly feel a bit more relaxed and more comfortable in a home environment. That's a very big generalisation, but um, that's the basis of where my research began. 
So I look at creativity in the large format re uh, recording space. So the large format studio emerged as a creative environment in the, uh, in the mid 60s and developed into an instrument and compositional tool in its own right. However, Williams posits that the common architecture of the large format studio is not unlike that of a prison panopticon with a division of power between the occupants of the control room and the artist being observed through the glass. This indicates that the, large form, that the laboratory like abstract space of the large format recording studio can adversely affect a recording. So, in the current era, professional results can be achieved in the comfort of your own home. The, the rise of DIY recording brings into question the large format studio as an active creative environment. The move towards DIY recording has put pressure on musicians to master a multitude of tasks beyond simply playing an instrument, uh, particularly production and engineering and programming. Solo performers being able to perform all their parts in a recording was not, was not simply possible before the 80s, and Taberge notes the loss of collective practices of music production with these, uh, employing these methods. Adding to that, what's an award? in 2013, point out the importance of the talents of the producer and engineer in getting the most out of the recording studio and enabling creative performances. So where does all, the, all of this meet together? If the large format studio is uh, leaving us, they're closing down around us, and people are recording more at home, where does the producer and the engineer fit into this? What are the implications for DIY recording practices? So we'll get into a little bit of the fun stuff, a little bit of theory. So space and time are conceptually implicated in each other. Trick and check posits that space may only be experienced in time and time only in space. I love that, it's great. <laughs> Just think about that one for a little bit. <laughs> while, while the links between space, time and creativity are not clear, they are confluent phenomena that, is, uh, that cannot be separated. However, there is little research into the relationship between creativity and time. Scott posits that recording studios in the cultural economy are often extremely unstable, finely grained, frequently and mediated by face-to-face -face contact, which means they also tend to absorb significant resources of time and energy. Time is considered an asset in the studio, often given more significance than the technology or the space. I think Brian Eno puts it best, and this is amazing that this quote is from 1980. Beware the panic effect that accompanies the high cost of studio time. One becomes increasingly oriented towards results and progressively less inclined to, to engage in experimental activities that might not lead anywhere. As a result of this, one focuses one's attention on the safe bet on the tried and tested techniques, which is interesting, Eric just brought up that very point uh, that Brian Eno said in 1981. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that's quite interesting. Recording in the large format studio therefore involves a direct time-money relationship which in turn impacts upon creativity. So creativity involves being completely absorbed in artistic goals. Csikszentmihalyi has named the state the flow experience. Don't we all love Csikszentmihalyi? In his studies on creativity, he noticed that when respondents are in an optimal experience of of uh, creativity, he called this the flow state. Uh, he noticed that, uh, that the perceptions of time are altered and that hours pass by in minutes and minutes can stretch out to seem like hours. The recording studio presents a precarious relationship between space and time. A lot of time is needed to record music and when creativity is copious, one's perception of time will alter. So I think when there's, uh, the clock is ticking, and there's budgets involved in this, uh, it is, gets even more pre pre precarious. So, I'll take you through my methodology. I combine participant observation with a practical-led led approach to investigate space as experienced by artists engaged in the recording process. I also engaged and participated in the creative practice of the participants, observing the participants in naturalistic scenarios, and I use interviews and field notes to assist in interpreting the attitudes of the, particip of the participants. Every recording for this research involved the creation of new work. Attempting to re-record the same song in the different scenarios would have revealed a contrived result. 
it's pretty hard to record the same song with the same thought again, particularly the second time. You'll probably want to improve it or do something different or try it. You could just, creativity will uh, not allow this to happen. <clears throat> I conducted a comparative set of music, uh, music production projects in different spatial scenarios with three different artists. This paper though is just focused on one artist in particular, but 10 songs. So I recorded a third of those songs, ish, when you think of 10 divided by three, um, in uh, QUT's large format studio. This is, the studios did change over the course of my research, but this is one of the recording spaces. In the large format studio, I sort of, there was no restrictions on the equipment we could use. You can see it's a very well equipped studio. Uh, but I did restrict the time um, uh, that was spent on each song. So I kept it down to about 12 hours per song, which is what in my creative practice is kind of normal, 12 to 16 hours to capture a song. <coughs> I then, uh, so the band sourced uh, an area where we would, uh, the DIY scenario, where there were restrictions on the equipment we used, um, that no microphone was worth more than $500 and I just had these, uh, uh, that, that was all the equipment I had, which if you compare to there, which actually there's three more racks down there, lots of gear, that was the gear that I had, um, you know, and then we had obviously guitar amps and pedals, etc. Um, yeah, and then also the times, As we spent much more time in the DIY scenario, we had to account for setting up, etc. I, and I kept a loose thing of 24 hours per song. Um, and I'm talking about eight hour days here. So, and usually we didn't spend that long, but I kept it quite open so we had lots of time to experiment. Uh, and there was a third environment, which was a combination of both, a hybrid environment, which is quite common, uh, where one may, may go to the large format studio to record drums and bass, the bed tracks for the song, and then overdub on them in a home environment. And I call that the hybrid. Uh, environment. So, I'll take you through uh, what the artists thought. The band for this research was a band called the Oyster Murders. Um, the name sort of sticks after a while, it doesn't sound so weird, but the first time it always does sound a bit weird. Uh, so that's the Oyster Murders there. We recorded 10 songs um, in three different studio environments. Uh, so I actually recorded three songs interviewed the band, we had a bit of a break, and then we recorded seven more songs and I interviewed them again. So it allowed me to see their uh, attitudes, how they changed over time, if there was any difference. So with this initial recording, the bass player, um, Chris McPherson, he said that he got nervous and he started making stupid mistakes in the studio. He was um, practicing all morning, it was fine. As soon as the red light came on, he got nervous, which was, you know, not surprising. I, I will also give you a little bit of context with the Oyster Murders. I've recorded that this was their second album. I've recorded one EP. I've recorded about 11 songs with them over their career where they may have recorded uh, before this time. And that's probably out of a total of 15 or 16 songs that they've recorded. So uh, I've worked with them for a while. This was not their first experience in the studio. Uh, so I then, uh, after recording Dakota, the song where um, the bass player got a bit nervous, we moved to recording a track called Shake Your Hand, which involved uh, a lot of editing, a lot of overdubbing. We didn't really, there wasn't a lot of live performance in the song. Uh, but I did, so this is the large format space um, at QUT Studios, drum kit, the Steinway piano, which kind of drives this song in particular. So, there was a lot of editing had to be done, and I like to edit things as I go. I don't like people overdubbing on uh, uh, an incorrect performance. So the artists noticed while I sort of made them edit uh, that the studio can feel a bit claustrophobic, there's nowhere to go or nothing really to do. But the, the caveat to that would be that this was a university setting. So if it was a, a professional large format studio, there'd be a ping pong room or a uh, video game or something to do in downtime, which the, the university didn't really cater for that. Uh, but overall, Wendy liked the large format experience, saying that it was uh, nice and smooth, and the expression she used was plug and play, uh, which is interesting. 
so the DIY recordings took place in this little house here on a 48-acre property at Mount Tambourine, so in a regional area of Queensland. Uh, this was the bass player's um, father's house, and uh, it had this beautiful A-framed uh, hall that was like a dining room. It probably had um, 25 foot ceilings and was about 30 foot long, so um, that was nice. And then it had this mezzanine level, which is where I set up the drums, which that's opening up into this big space here. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was good fun, it was a nice space. There's a yes, standard DIY recording vocal booth with mattresses up on the, floor, on the walls. So this is uh, my impressions. I, 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 setting up the studio was not fun. You know, it's not, the, the first day of recording was not enjoyable. Um, uh, and then there was also some uh, latency involved between using, I was using UAD uh, preamps, etc. And I did have a few issues with latency when I was recording the vocals. And Grant, the singer, uh, expressed that he found it a little bit harder to sing in this environment, particularly with doing the vocals, but there was nothing that he couldn't uh, overcome. <coughs> so at the end of this recording, we just did three songs. Uh, the each of the participants had differing views of the recording space. Some preferred the DIY, some preferred the large format studio. So I'll skip along to recording two. Uh, so again, the uh, setting up, so, the, so recording two, uh, QUT had moved their studios, which was uh, unfortunate in the middle of my recording, and it took a long time, it kept getting delayed, delayed, and the band were wanting to record. So I decided to reverse my initial concept of the hybrid recording, where I recorded the, I recorded the two DIY songs plus two hybrid songs in the DIY scenario first before going into the large format studio. Um, but because I'd already been in the environment before, I, I didn't think it would interrupt my uh, methodology as we're still recording in different, different spaces. So again, setting up was a pain in the ass. <coughs> but the artists had a different view of this. They actually liked assisting me uh, in, in the setup. So whereas at, at QUT, where they're, where they're setting up this, this uh, quote is from obviously after the, the whole place, but they, they felt like they were just being the performer. Whereas a tambourine, they felt like they were kind of involved in everything, involved in the space. They felt like they, they were having a bit of ownership over the space. So we also, in the DIY space, we started to record a few songs that were not fully arranged or finished. And I, I liked the idea of tackling some uh, less standard pieces. The artists, upon reflection of this recording, they decidedly prefer the DIY scenario this time. Uh, and this is what Wendy said. She said she felt really relaxed and she felt more involved in the recording as opposed to the first time. Perhaps it was we were doing more songs in the second session rather than the first session. It allowed a bit more time for, to process what was going on. So this is after the, the first session at QUT's studios. This is the new studio, pretty much the same equipment from the last large format photo, photo uh, but it's moved into this new building which was a lovely environment, it's got a beautiful view of the city, a bucket loads of gear again. Uh, and there's, there's the drum set up. So, and this is a brand new studio and we were one of the first bands in there, so I asked the band if they liked being in a brand new studio, which is, you know, you don't get to do that every day. Uh, I did enjoy doing vocals and stuff in that sort of space, but Grant, the singer, he felt more pressure. Um, the expensive equipment, etc. I think there's a picture at the end of the vocals set up. Uh, he, he felt pressure to perform with the expensive equipment around. Uh, <clears throat> so, however, at the end of the session, uh, the time pressure of being in the de in the large format space created some urgency in some performances. There was that sort of thing. Hey, I've got one more thing to do before we had to go. And it, we, we got some really good things in, those la in that last half hour of the recording. And there was a bit of urgency in the performances. And there was that feeling of, we've got to get it done now or never. Despite the fact that through all these recordings, the artists ad added overdubs from their home studio. So anything that didn't get done by the timeline could have been added to later at home. But of course, I wasn't there at home. Though, so there were artist-led um, additions. 
So uh, here's um, some of what they, they felt. So despite um, uh, McPherson, the bass player, feeling um, uncomfortable in recording one, as, as he was going through things, he started to attribute his feelings more towards the song and not so much towards the space. So in the second lot of recording, we actually, there was a lot more songs where his parts weren't finished or we changed his parts significantly. But despite that, he, he, it, it happened in either environment, but he, he tied that feeling of discomfort towards the song to the song and not to the space. Uh, <clears throat> so during, this is their overall feelings. During the recording, the performers noticed challenges in the DIY scenarios, but still refer, re, uh, prefer the relaxed environment of the DIY space. So this is Wendy, so again she noticed there was a few technical things that were not as uh, good at Mount Tambourine, the DIY space, but she still felt more comfortable. So uh, QUT Studio has nice little uh, fallback mixes for all of the artists, whereas at Tambourine I was controlling their fallback from a little mixer that I've got. Um, and just latency, etc. It did sort of affect things, and sometimes it slowed us down. So, concluding, uh, using the same participants revealed a unanimous shift towards DIY recording approaches. In recording two, the participants became indifferent to the recording results and more focused on the experience of recording. They adapted their creative approach according to the recording situation they were in, and found the whole recording experience to be positive. The band linked any audible sonic differences to the artistic direction in the song. So the band does, we, they sort of traverse between being a pop band or an indie rock band to being quite experimental at times. The large format studio was more uh, efficient and the term they used was plug and play. Preparing and assembling the DIY studio was arduous. More for me though, however the unique space increased novelty in the recording and the participants reported feeling uh, more involved in the produ overall production when they were enabled to help set up the recording space. As a performance space, the participants enjoyed the efficiency of the large format studio but preferred the relaxed nature of the DIY situation. The large format space created a perceived pressure to perform amongst the expensive equipment and the reduced time allowance contributed to that pressure. Uh, we exceeded... Oh, that one didn't come up. We exceeded what we uh, planned to record in the DIY scenario. There it is there. But we did not complete all the final overdubs in the large format situation, which I don't think that's unusual. Uh, however, as I said before, all of the songs involve some artist-led uh, overdubs from their home studios. The participants enjoyed time gaps between the sessions and the reaction to the hybrid environment was positive. Even though I feel that budgetary restrictions are getting to the point where even hybrid recording uh, bands are unwilling to part with any money at all these days, in, particularly in the self-funded era. The impetus for recording in DIY situations tends to be largely financial. See, I just made that point again. <coughs> but it can also be a way to use budgetary restrictions to advantage, allowing more time for artistic exploration, more time to use this, the studio as a musical instrument that it once was. The band all choose the DIY scenario when asked where they felt that they got the best value for money, which I think is a big thing. DIY recording is not as technically efficient as large format studio spaces, which are hand-wired and permanently set up to record. However, the preparation for, D, uh, the DIY, the preparation for DIY recording can be immense, but once set up, the lack of time restrictions can lead to spending more time on a recording than might otherwise be the case. Overwhelmingly, the Oyster Murders reported that having ample time to get the right sounds and performances were the most important aspects of recording. There's some references, there's some pictures. Let's, let's ask a question. Okay. Uh, and I'll get it happening. Time for two questions and maybe we'll sneak back for some music. Okay. Do you want? So, in a uh, uh, large format uh, studio space, you kind of have uh, acoustic treatments and they've been designed specific rooms for specific piece of characteristics but in the DIY spaces you're obviously well, you mostly would imagine not working in this kind of treated space. No. 
for so your, your, your review or your uh, participants, were you aware of that or any responses to that? Uh, well, I was aware of it. Like I've I've done a lot of uh, mobile recording, DIY recording in my time as a in my creative practice. So it was nothing unusual for me. Uh, I think the most interesting thing with with it was in the mixing process. I know I didn't mention mixing at all in the in the presentation, but in the mixing process, I found uh, mixing the DIY songs did take a bit longer. But in the end, as my, my paper last year kind of showed that the, I, I played all the recordings to seven different producers and the results I got were very scattered. No one could really, I, I was asking the producers, can they pick which song was recorded where? And they, they couldn't. So there was, you know, a lot of people, because I had such a nice room to record in as well, I think that fooled people a bit because there's some big, nice, roomy drum sounds on some songs and people just instantly think that that's got to be a recording studio, but it wasn't. But yeah, I, the thing that I found the most challenging was probably monitoring conditions in the control room that it set up. Um, uh, you know, sometimes it was lying to me a little bit, but there was nothing that I, I couldn't overcome, which I think is the biggest thing. As much as, as budgets come into this, where it's hard to record in such a nice studio to afford it, um, and there's a lot of things that don't workflow-wise, you know, as Eric was making, workflow is such an important thing, Workflow was not as easy in the DIY context, but the bottom line is it can be done. And I, I kind of got to a point where, even as I said, I see it says display port. Even as I said, it's um, I, I find it hard to tell which songs I recorded where. I can't remember. Uh, as as a, a teacher and instructor, I, I, what, what do you see for in the future in terms of curriculum and good preparing? good question because this is really what's burnt my that's what sort of gets my goat with, and that's why that's what informed this research because I feel you know QUT studios are probably the best studios in Brisbane well you know where, where I'm from and we're sort of the students this is we're sort of saying this is recording and I'm like it's not I, I feel like recording should be uh, a few road cases and then we should, for their final folios, send them off, find somewhere to record and come back and, you know, you, we should have given you the tools to learn how to do it yourself. Because when they leave the degrees, that's what they're going to be doing. They're never going to be walking into, well, most, you can't say all, right. but it's unlikely that people will be using these spaces that are currently our pedagogical tools for recording. Like, I haven't seen the studios here, but I'm sure they're very nice. Yeah. yeah. I look forward to seeing it in this. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.